every once in a while, someone gets actually interested in what I'm mumbling about here. <laughs> so this is some beautiful work that you did. Um, and to show you how much faster computers are, you say it took you, it took you 40 minutes to generate these graphs. OK. Originally, when we generated these graphs, um, it took well over a month, I think close to two months. <laughs> so computers are a lot faster. Um, so this is, um, you remember the picture I showed you, but this is a much, much more detailed and much better picture than what I showed you. Um, and you can see, remember I told you that the, these regions, these different regions where the, ex, where the continued exponential converges, look like tadpoles with very long tails. And now, and you remember in the picture that I showed you, these regions were just sort of cutting off, OK, like this. But now you can see these regions in great detail, which is fantastic. That's a beautiful picture. I think we, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed. This, this is really beautiful. But there, there are another couple of pictures. Let's see if I can show you. Um, Yeah, so this, I think, is extraordinary because you captured this incredibly fine detail in here. These, these details are just absolutely beautiful. Um, so each of these tails becomes exponentially thin, but these tails per persist. I mean, they go all the way off, run off to infinity. Okay, and this this crescent-shaped region here—that's where even you were unable to distinguish. So, how many how many um, how many different um, regions did you did you identify? Did you have twelve colors, or do you, you had a hundred different colors? I see. So, you were actually sensitive to to uh, when you went into an orbit with a hundred limit points. Wow. 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 That's really that's fantastic. That's absolutely I see. So we only did twelve. So we so in order to determine that you had an orbit, in order to be sure that you were in a limit cycle containing a hundred limit points, um how how many iterations were you doing? Many, many thousands of iterations, obviously, right? I was, I was doing a total of something. I, it's not that good precision, but I was doing a total of, say, 200 iterations, and then I was looking at the tail part. Uh -huh. So the 100 isn't really good. How many decimal places accuracy were you keeping? Um, Double precision, and then I was taking the. Uh, Double precision means 16, about? Is it better? I don't know. Yeah. Or is it. It may be. I think it's better. It could be 30. It's better. Yeah, it's 30. It's better it could be 30 play. Okay. That, that's double. Okay. So it's not like Fortran double precision. It's, there's 30. No. Uh, it's uh -huh. better than. Okay. 30 is good. 16, I would worry about. But, yeah. But that's the detail there is spectacular. Um, let me show you. So again, you can see these um, these very very long tails, which is just wonderful. Um, I don't know how much computing would be required to actually follow these tails. Because this, is, this area is now incredibly dense with tails. I mean, to, 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 um, you know, to distinguish these very, very fine lines, I, I don't know what kind of massive amounts of computing time would be required. But it's really spectacular. Um, so um, bravo. That's, that's really fantastic. Okay. 
Okay, so that's and and you're working. You you said you're working on some other continued functions to see what happens. Which fun? Which ones are you looking at? Which which of the continued functions are you looking at now? Okay, we'll look at them. You looked at sine, continued sine. Uh -huh. Cosine? Uh -huh. so, it'll be, mm -hmm. so it'll be interesting to see. See, this, this kind of structure is not observable uh, ordinarily when you have a continued fraction. And that's because the continued fraction usually converges in a cut plane. So it doesn't converge usually, not always, but usually just on a line Okay, for some functions. Now, for other functions, the continued fraction itself may have structures like this. Um, but I kind of doubt that it would be so interesting. But sine may be even more interesting. I don't know. And logarithm may be. So who knows what's going to happen? It's kind of interesting. Um, OK. OK, so we started, we started working on a problem last time. And um, what I want, the, the thing that I, I, so what I did last time was to explain to you how, um, um, I, I, I first explained to you what a, a asymptotic series is and what it means for a series to represent an asymptotic series to represent a function. Okay? And I defined what is meant by saying that if you have a function of x and it has an asymptotic series representation, say, of this form, okay, and there are, this is just a, a, sp a specific case of an asymptotic series representation, what does that mean? Okay, And I explained that what this means, this is, the, this is specifically what it means. It means that for all n, the partial sums of that series are asymptotic to the function f. Or more precisely, the partial sums minus f are asymptotic to the next term in the series. So if you look at the difference of f of x and the sum from n equals 0 to n, okay, this thing is asymptotic to um, a sub n plus 1, x to the n plus 1, okay, as x goes to 0. Okay, that's what it means. So each successive partial sum is better than the previous partial sum in the sense that it is asymptotic to something which is going to 0 faster as x goes to 0. Okay? So we're always interested in the limit as x goes to 0. We're never interested in the limit as n goes to infinity. Okay? We would only be interested in the limit as n goes to infinity if we had a convergent series. But the chance of having a convergent series is just about 0. That's a very, very special case of a series. The ar any arbitrary series that you pull out of your hat is going to be a divergent series. No reason for a series to converge. That's a very, very special thing. It's the same thing as saying, you know, if you pick an arbitrary function, what's the chance that it'll be differentiable? <laughs> 0. Yeah, very small chance that it would be differentiable. OK? So this is the key thing. Now, this may look a little bit um, arbitrary or extraordinary or something like that. And the reason is that in the mathematics that is generally taught, you never teach things like divergent series. So you're excluding all of the interesting math and all of the powerful math. And that's the problem with rigorous mathematics. Okay? You exclude all of the things that you can do that are powerful as far as solving problems. <clears throat> but what I am arguing 
is that you are inevitably led to such series because you can write down differential equations. And as soon as you write down a differential equation, when you solve it, you are going to come across series like this. And the equation we looked at, we started to look at, so I want to finish looking at it now. <clears throat> the equation we started to look at was the equation x cubed y double prime equals y. Okay, And we said, how does y behave as x goes to 0? Okay, that, that's, that's the question that we looked at. Okay, And we agreed that the only thing we know, as far as rigorous mathematics, and that's what, that's what Sarah was teaching, was, you know, can we look for a Taylor series solution? No. We know that because x equals 0 is an irregular singular point, that not all solutions can possibly be a Taylor series. That's the first thing we expect. And the second thing we know <clears throat> is that even a Frobenius series is not going to work. And that's it. That's the end of our repertoire. Can't, can't do anything more. So we need to do something clever and new and original and fresh. And you can trace this idea all the way back to uh, Mr. Green, who said, why don't you try a solution of the form y equals e to the s? Okay. Now, I want very carefully to distinguish between equal signs and uh, asymptotic signs. Okay. So obviously, if I have a function y, I could always write it as an exponential of another function s. Okay. There's nothing stopping me from doing that. So there's an equal sign here. Okay, But Mr. Green suggests that if you take s prime squared, this guy is going to be big as x goes to 0, Okay, compared with s double prime. <clears throat> That's the approximation that we're making. And this, and this is as x goes to 0. And that's because of Mr. Shakespeare. So Green was a very cultured man. And he, he realized that s must be something. This, this, this is an ingenious idea. okay? And it's, I, and it's based on the idea that s is something like, something like s is going to be, we're guessing that s is going to be something like um, a x to the b, where b is less than zero. <clears throat> okay, because s because s is blowing up at zero, and we expect it to blow up at zero because zero is an irregular singular point. <clears throat> so that was an inspired guess. Of course, we're going to verify that guess. You know, this is just a guess, and it could be wrong. It may not be true in all cases. Okay. <clears throat> But given that, given this, this clever idea, how do we proceed? Okay, So we proceed, um, just up a little bit. How do we proceed? We say, if this is true, let's plug this into this differential equation. And we get x cubed times s uh, prime squared plus s double prime uh, is equal to 1. Okay, you all understand where this equation comes from. We just differentiated this guy, plugged it in, canceled off the exponential from both sides. Okay, and that's something that, that, by the way, canceling this exponential is something we can do because the equation is linear. If the equation were nonlinear and we had another week, I would give you a, a course about how to solve nonlinear equations, approximately. But we're working within limits. Okay? And that gets extraordinarily interesting. But we're not even going to touch that. So we're only talking about linear equations here. And, <clears throat> and it's a good thing that the Schrodinger equation is linear, because that's where we're heading for. OK, so, so how do we proceed? This equation cannot be solved, because 
it involves an equal sign. But the idea is that this term here is going to is small in an asymptotic sense as x goes to 0 and therefore we replace an exact equation which is not solvable by an asymptotic relation which is okay and the asymptotic relation is that x cubed s prime squared is asymptotic to 1 okay as x goes to 0 so here is a three term um, uh, an exact equation, an exact three-term equation, but the method of dominant balance by the method of dominant balance, which is inspired by all the way back to Shakespeare, we convert this into a two-term equation, which now we can solve, because this is, this is now trivial. It's hardly anything to think about. So <clears throat> let's solve it. <clears throat> OK, so we take that equation. We um, divide by x cubed. OK, we take the square root of both sides. OK, we integrate both sides. Let's write it minus or plus 2 over the square root of x. OK, and by the way, oh, there would be a constant of integration, but we don't even care about that, OK? Because asymptotics always makes things simple. So great. So here's, here's this equation. We now know, yeah? Uh, I guess I really this one. Because if, if I have some, some function uh, that will go uh, like to 5 and I add a constant, it will go to something else. Yes. But a number. this, but you understand, a constant is just one of many, many, many functions which are small compared with this. There may be yet something else which is more important than that constant. We're eventually going to. In, we're eventually going to include a constant, but at this point, there's no reason to keep a constant because, as you're going to see in just a second, there's another thing that's far more important than that constant. Okay, you, we'll, we'll see that in just a second. You, you're going to see that. Okay, but the point is, you see, this is a true statement. If you add a constant, it's still a true statement. So why bother to add a constant? It's already true. Okay, But you're going to see that this equation gets refined. This equation is going to be refined by something else that is also more important than that constant. That constant is way in the background. Okay. So we have calculated an asymptotic approximation to s. And by the way, there are two answers, as there ought to be, because there are two solutions to this equation. But the problem that we have at this point is that we cannot necessarily conclude that y, which is equal to e to the s, is asymptotic to e to the minus or plus 2 over the square root of x. This is not a valid conclusion yet. Okay, So we have to, we have to verify. We have to continue this process. Okay, so we need to go more deeply into this equation. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, next step. We know that S is asymptotic to this. Let's look at the next correction. Now, as you say, you're, you're thinking that the next correction might be a constant. Or it might not be. And we're going to find out. Okay, so now we're going to say let S... Now, notice how I go back and forth between asymptotic signs and equal signs. We can now say that s is equal to the function minus or plus 2 over the square root of x plus something else. And since you think it might be a constant, OK, let's call it c. But it also might be a function. 
So let's call it c of x. Okay, because it could could well be a function. Okay, so from this result here, from this result here, I can conclude that s is equal to that plus a, a function. Okay, but what are the properties of that function? Okay, where c of x is negligible compared with 2 over the square root of x. And who cares about 2? If I'm talking about negligible, it can be 1 over the square root of x. It doesn't make any difference. Okay, As x goes to 0. Now, do you see the logic here? We have calculated an asymptotic approximation to s. Okay. If s is asymptotic to this, then it's equal to it. And the difference is some other function, c, which is negligible compared with this, Okay, as x goes to 0. Now, do you all understand that? Okay, So now, okay, you all comfortable with that? OK. Now, you can differentiate both sides of an asymptotic relation if we're solving uh, differential equations. And so if it's true that c is negligible compared with 1 over the square root of x, then by the way, c prime would be negligible compared with x to the 1 over x to the 3 halves. And c double prime would be negligible compared with um, 1 over x to the 5 halves, all as, uh, as x goes to 0. OK. Great. Now, let's continue our analysis. Let's go back to this equation here. And let's no longer neglect s double prime. OK? So the equation that we're looking at is x cubed times s prime squared uh, plus s double prime is equal to 1. And because we have said that s is equal to minus or plus um, 2 over the square root of x plus c. We also know that s prime is equal to, notice I'm using equal signs here. There's an equal sign here. This is the equation we're trying to solve. Okay, So it's an equality. It's an equation, not a relation, but an equation. Okay, So s prime would be equal to uh, plus or minus 1 over x to the 3 halves plus c prime. Okay, And s double prime would be equal to minus or plus um, the derivative of x to the minus 3 halves is 3 halves times 1 over x to the 5 halves plus c double prime. OK? Do you see the logic behind this? Now, we're going to take this guy here, and we're going to take this guy here, plug it into the equation, and see what we get. Now, it's going to be a little bit messier, but nevertheless, let's plug it in. So the equation reads x cubed times, now, s prime squared. We have to square this nonsense here. So this would be 1 over x cubed from here. Squaring that would give, give me c prime squared. And 2 times plus or minus 2 times 1 over x to the 3 halves times c prime. OK? So I've squared this. Now I have to plug in s double prime. And s double prime would be minus or plus 3 halves 1 over x to the 5 halves plus c um, prime prime. And that's equal to 1. Now. Let's see. <clears throat> I have to convince you, I guess using this thing here, I have to convince you, I hope this isn't going to be difficult, that the original equation we started out solving just has two terms in it. We have now replaced this equation by that equation. which is nonlinear and ugly as all get out. It's just horrible. It's a horrible looking equation. Okay, It isn't really 
absolutely all this horrible because there's a little bit of cancellation. Okay. Do you notice that the first term, 1 over x cubed times x cubed is 1, which cancels that 1? But it's still ugly. Let's cancel this against this. The equation is still ugly, of course. Okay, it's nonlinear. It's really terrible looking. Okay, it's really terrible looking. If we write out the equation, you notice this is now equal to zero. So as an equation, I can take off this x cubed. Okay, and I can write down c prime squared. That's the first term plus or minus 2 over x to the 3 halves c prime, uh, minus or plus 3 over 2x to the 5 halves from here, plus c double prime is equal to 0. So this is a nonlinear four-term equation. Yeah? The x cubed, where x is never equal to 0 here. Nothing would exist at x equals 0. We're only interested in the limit as x goes to 0. But x is not equal to 0. It's never equal to 0 because that's a singular point. We could never do this calculation at 0. <laughs> OK, we're only interested in what happens as you approach 0. OK, so x is never, never, never equal to 0. OK, I mean, nothing here exists at x equals 0. This is all singular at x equals 0. OK, so can we make progress? Well, yes, we can. Because you remember our assumption about c is that c is negligible compared with x to the 5 halves. This is the method of dominant balance in asymptotics. OK? All four of these equations are all of, four of these terms are not the same size in this equation. Some of them are big, some of them are insignificant. Okay? So for example, we assume that c double prime is insignificant compared with 1 over x to the 5 halves. And there is a 1 over x to the 5 halves in this equation. Therefore, this term we neglect. It's unimportant. Furthermore, if you look at this, this says c prime is negligible compared with 1 over x to the 3 halves, right? Therefore, look, I, I invite you to look at this term and at this term. Both of these terms contain a c prime. But this term contains a c prime times 1 over x to the 3 halves. And this term contains a c prime times a c prime, which is bigger. Okay, this clearly has to be the bigger term because c prime is negligible compared with 1 over x to the 3 halves. That's great. Why is that so good? That's especially good. This is good. It's good that I could eliminate this term because now it's not a second order equation anymore. It's a first order equation. Okay? Why is it good that this term is negligible? Because it makes it linear. It's no longer a nonlinear equation. Here we lowered the order of the equation. Here we made the equation linear. Isn't asymptotics fantastic? This is not something that just happened to happen here. It's just a general fact. So we can throw this away compared with that term. <clears throat> Great. Now we have just a two-term equation, which is linear. So let's, let's solve this equation. So of course, when we throw away this and this, it is no longer an equality. It's an asymptotic relation, right? So, <clears throat> so when we throw this and this away, we conclude that plus or minus 2 over, the, two over x to the 3 have c prime um, minus or plus 3 over 2 x to the 5 halves um, is asymptotic to 0, right? Nope. You're shaking your head. Nope, can't do that. Can't write that. Nothing is asymptotic to 0. So if we're going to do this, we have to do it carefully. We have to put this on the other side of the equation, change the minus or plus to plus or minus, and write an asymptotic sign now. 
and this now has to be accompanied by a limit as x approaches 0. Okay. <clears throat> okay, good. So the plus or minus cancels off from both sides, right? They just forget this plus or minus. Okay, and um, now I can, and if I multiply by x to the 3 halves and divide by 2, I conclude that c prime is asymptotic to 3 over 4x as x goes to 0. Okay. And therefore, c is asymptotic to 3 quarters log of x as x goes to 0. Aha! Now here's the answer to your question. We looked at the correction to the behavior. Remember, we concluded at first that s goes like 1 over the square root of x. And you thought, maybe we should add a constant. And I said, before we add a constant, let's check to see if there's something else that might be more important than that constant as a correction. Okay? And the answer is, there is something more important, because a logarithm of x is always, as x goes to 0, is always much more important than a constant. Okay? So I'm not throwing out your idea of adding a constant, but that constant could only appear after we have discovered the log of x. Okay? But we have learned something else. We have learned that, in fact, it was wrong to try to exponentiate this asymptotic approximation because the difference between s and this was still big as x goes to 0, logarithmically big. Okay, Now let me tell you, let me now make you happy. In fact, the next term after the logarithm is a constant. Okay. And so now it's not big as x goes to 0. Okay, And we can now exponentiate this asymptotic approximation. The next term is indeed a constant. Um, <clears throat> so what do we conclude from here? We are now concluding that a new and better approximation to the function s is this. s goes like uh, minus or plus. 2 over the square root of x plus this term, plus 3 quarters log of x as x goes to 0. OK. And OK, this is as x goes to 0. Um, let's raise this. Okay, um, okay we'll raise this up. OK, so what have we concluded? s is equal to minus or plus 2 over the square root of, uh, 2 over the square root of x plus 3 over 4 log x plus something else. OK, that's all we can conclude at this point. And I'm not going to waste too much of your time, but I'm going to claim that d in fact, in fact, turns out to be some constant, d, something like that, just, just a constant, um, plus a correction of order uh, square root of x plus something else times um, x plus something else times x to the 3 halves, and so on. OK? <clears throat> So this looks like a series in powers of the square root of x. And if you continue this procedure over and over and over again, wait a minute. This reminds us of something we were doing with perturbation theory. This is pre-perturbation theory. We don't have a parameter epsilon. And yet, if you think about it, what we have done is we've taken an incredibly difficult equation an incredibly difficult problem, namely that problem up there, that differential equation. And we've reduced it to a series of trivial, really almost high school level calculations. And the answer that's coming out has this very interesting structure. 
And now all we have to do to recover the answer is to exponentiate it. So we conclude that y should be asymptotic to. Now we can exponentiate it because the corrections here are small. So if we exponentiate it, we conclude that y has some constant, k plus or minus, some, just some number. The exponential of d is just some number. Okay times e to the minus or plus 2 over the square root of x. And the exponential of 3 quarters log x would be x to the 3 quarters. And when you exponentiate this series, you're going to get a new series in powers of the square root of x. OK, so it's some new series of the form, sum from n equals 0 to infinity <clears throat> a sub n square root of x to the n. We're going to talk about this series in just a second. Okay, so we, we don't know these coefficients. And I claim that this is the form, but I haven't showed that to you yet. But you're going to see it in just a moment. Look at that. That is really fantastic. But now, did, 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 does this, is this meaningful? Do you believe this? This is supposed to be how y of x behaves as x goes to 0. Do you believe this? Do you, you think this is true? For example, let's take the simplest asymptotic approximation. We say that y of x, if you, if you saw, put this equation on a computer, I'm trying to relate this to reality here. You have an equation, you know? x cubed y double prime equals y. Take an initial condition. y of 1 is equal to, give me a number. Zero, fine. And y prime of 1? Zero. Ah, but what, will, what solution will you get now? Zero. Exactly. <laughs> That's not so interesting. But you can take y of 1 to be 0. That doesn't matter. But you can take it to be anything. Let's just alpha, what, y of 1. y prime of 1 is beta. Any numbers you like. Doesn't make any difference. We claim that the solution, y of x, is going to be a linear combination of solutions, one of which is blowing up exponentially, because it has a plus sign, as x goes to 0. The other one is going to 0 exponentially fast. So the one that's going to 0 becomes insignificant compared with the one that's blowing up. So we claim, this is our prediction, this is a very sophisticated prediction, we claim that y of x is asymptotic to some constant times e to the 2 over the square root of x times x to the 3 quarters. Okay. Do you notice that this is the effect, this term here is the effect of the irregular singular point. If it were only a regular singular point, then you would have an index, just this. And if it were a regular point, you'd have a Taylor-like series. Okay, except this isn't a Taylor series because it's a series in powers of the square root of x. Okay, so it's not a Taylor-like series, but irregular, reg regular, singular, and finally regular. Okay, Taylor series like structure. Yeah. So what is that series going to be? Uh, we're going to find out. So we don't know whether this series would converge or diverge. Let me give you the answer. It diverges. Typically, the series diverges. Okay. But nevertheless, let's, let's forget that for a second. Our asymptotic approximation is this as x goes to 0. This is what we claim. And we can test this. Okay, All we need to do is to make a, so here's, here's a numerical exercise for you. Calculate the exact, the exact function y of x. Divide it by, um, e to the 2 over the square root of x, which is blowing up unbelievably fast, and divide it by x to the 3 halves. OK? And let, let's plot this as x goes to 0. The question is, does this approach a constant as x goes to 0? I mean, you understand, if this were x to the 5 halves plus 0.1, it would not approach a constant. It would blow up or go to 0 or something like this. You understand? 
If we got this number 2 wrong, if the number 2 were really 1.5, then this would blow up or go to 0 as x goes to 0. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we're making an extremely precise statement about, about how the function y of x behaves. OK, well, now I want you to look up here. This is precisely what I did. OK, I took as, for simplicity, I took initial conditions y of 1 equals 1 and y prime of 1 is equal to 0. So it's almost what you suggested. OK, took, took one of your two conditions. Okay. So how does this function, if, and then I calculated this ratio, precisely what I wrote on the blackboard. OK, and look what happens. As x goes to 0, this approaches very nicely. It approaches a constant as x goes to 0. That constant, the value of this constant, 0. 0.1432, that doesn't make any difference. That's just some constant k. And we don't care which constant it is. But this means we understand how the solution behaves at 0 or in the neighborhood of 0. You understand? And it's a very, very rapidly varying function. And yet, we caught the variation of the function with precision. We understand exactly how it behaves. OK? Now, you should be unbelievably impressed, because we have cracked a very, very, very hard problem. But the question is, what do we do next? OK? And something is suggested to us by looking at that graph. Can you look at the graph and see something interesting about that? Can you, can you guess? Are you a little bit inspired? If you look at that graph. What do you see? The graph tells you something quite interesting. Very good. Very smart. Bravo. OK. So now can you elaborate on that? Aha. Uh -huh. Good point. That's right. That's right. So what you noticed, excellent. This is a fun class to teach. OK. It's very difficult to teach Socratically, because if you ask questions as you go along, but you don't get answers after a while, you have to give up Socratic teaching. It's not, it doesn't work. OK. What you noticed was very interesting. You noticed that it did approach a constant. But it didn't approach a constant the way we would normally expect. If I said, you're approaching a constant, okay, how would you approach a constant? You would think, if this is a constant here, okay, that you would approach the constant, or let's call it k, you would think that you might approach the constant like this. Okay? But that's not how we approached a constant. We approached a constant like this. Okay? So that suggests that the slope at 0, the derivative of the function at 0, is not a, a constant, but rather it's becoming infinite. Okay, You notice the slope at this point appears to be becoming infinite. Okay, And that is because the next term in this series is the square root of x. So if I took the derivative and asked, how does it approach that constant? The derivative of the square root of x is, as you know, 1 over the square root of x, which is becoming infinite. So that's very good. That was the point. The way it approaches this point is interesting. Okay, So we have to study that. But before we do that, let's talk about physics. Okay, Because I want to show you something very interesting that I hope you will recognize. You understand the calculation, I, this equation here, this equation that we've been solving, OK, is um, this two-term differential equation that we've been solving is, um, or this equation here, is a Schrodinger equation. What happens in general for a Schrodinger equation? Just in general. Suppose we were solving a Schrodinger equation. y prime prime equals q of x times y. 
an arbitrary. Of course, this is not the way you usually write down the Schrodinger equation. You usually write down the Schrodinger equation this way, minus y prime prime plus v of x times y is equal to e times y. But I suggest, why don't we just rewrite that Schrodinger equation as y prime prime um, is equal to v of x minus e times y. And then let's call this thing q of x. Okay, so for simplicity, this is the form of the equation that we're solving. Okay, now, suppose we were solving this equation near a, um, an irregular singular point. What will we find? Do you have a question? Yeah. We don't know. Nope, we don't know E. Nope, we don't know E. We're just approaching a... Uh, a regular singular point of the, uh, of the function q. So typically, q is some potential. q, you know, for the harmonic oscillator is x squared minus e. And at x equals infinity, this potential is blowing up. So we have an irregular singular point of the differential equation. Okay? Or the potential could be x to the 4 or sine of x. And all of these functions are. Uh, not analytic at infinity. Okay, so now we're asking what happens as x goes to infinity. But in general, we'll, we can be arbitrary about it. We'll just say, suppose x is an irregular singular point, and in general, we're approaching x equals a, where a could be infinity. Doesn't matter. But let's leave everything arbitrary now. Just leave it arbitrary. Let's see what happens. <clears throat> before we continue with that equation. Because I want to show you that what we did was quite general. Okay, So suppose we just proceed with this equation instead of a specific function q, which in, in this case is just 1 over x cubed. Okay? So what do we do? You say, let y equal e to the s. Let's just quickly go through the steps. Okay, Y is equal to e to the s. Plug it in. You get y, uh, you get s uh, prime squared plus s prime prime uh, is equal to q. Do you agree? Okay, that's the equality. Now we throw this away. We make an asymptotic approximation. S prime squared is asymptotic to q as x approaches a. So s prime is asymptotic to plus or minus the square root of q as x goes to a. So s is asymptotic to plus or minus the integral of the square root of q of, let's call it q of s ds. <coughs> I don't like s. q of t dt. OK? So that's s as, as uh, x approaches a. OK? That's the first step. Zoom. Got right to the answer. OK, next we go back to inequality. We say s equals plus or minus the integral up to x, square root of q of t dt, right? Um, plus some function c of x, where c of x is negligible compared with the integral of the square root of q of t dt. Right? And if I differentiate this, I get c prime is negligible compared with the square root of q. Or if I differentiate it again, I get c double prime is negligible compared with <clears throat> q prime uh, over the square root of q. q prime over the square root of q, all as uh, x approaches a. And I'm leaving a arbitrary. You see what I've done? I'm just repeating everything I did except with in, in complete generality. What's the next step? I now actually differentiate this equation here. And I conclude that, I conclude, if I differentiate that, that s prime is equal to 
uh, the derivative of that would be plus or minus um, the square root of q, square root of q, plus c prime. And the second derivative would be plus or minus q prime over 2 square root of q plus c double prime. Are you following this? You got it? Now, let's take these two equations and do a more accurate calculation by plugging these equations into this. Let's take this equation over here, plug in this, and see what we get. The first term is s prime squared, right? So I square this. And if I square this, the first term I get is q. The second term I get is c prime squared. And then I get a cross term, which is plus or minus 2 c prime square root of q. OK, you all with me? So I've squared this and plugged it in. Then I have to plug in s double prime. If I plug in s double prime, I get plus or minus. Um, oops, I forgot. Uh, yeah, here's a plus or minus. Now I get plus or minus q prime over 2 square root of q plus c double prime. And all this is equal to q. That's an equality. Look at that equation. It's horrible, right? Just the way the equation we got for c was horrible. Except we do get one cancellation. Do you remember that we canceled off right here? You remember we canceled off 1? Why is that? Why did 1 cancel? Because we got the first term in this expansion, the first term here, right. So we got the cancellation. When we do it again, we will get two cancellations, because we got the second term right, and then three cancellations. It'll still be an ugly equation, but the cancellations tell us we haven't made an algebraic mistake. And notice that we got one cancellation here. So we have a four-term equation, just as we got over here. There's a four-term equation. After we did that cancellation, we had this horribly ugly four-term equation. But then we said, yeah, but there are some terms we can neglect here. Can we do the same thing here? Yes. Why can we do that? Well, we said by assumption that c double prime was negligible compared with q prime over the square root of q. Right? Here is a c double prime. And here's a q prime over the square root of q. So I suggest we drop this term compared with that. That's our assumption about c. Okay, That's great, because now this is not a second order equation. It's a first order equation. But it's still nonlinear. However, look, here's a c prime squared. That's the nonlinear term. And we assumed that c prime was negligible compared with the square root of q. Here is a c prime times c prime. And here is a c prime times the square root of q. Which is more important? Well, this is. Isn't asymptotics wonderful? So we will neglect this term as well. And furthermore, you notice the plus or minuses have canceled out, just as they did over here. Remember, there was no more plus or minus issue. And so if we just write down this single equation, we conclude that c prime times the square root of q times 2 is asymptotic to minus q prime over 2 square root of q. OK, as x approaches a. So we have replaced an equality, which we can't solve, by an asymptotic relation, which of course we're going to be able to solve. And we conclude that c prime is minus q prime over 4q as x goes to a. OK, now we have to integrate this. So we conclude that c is asymptotic to minus 1 quarter log of q. Yeah? Why do you know how 
this time, how do, how do I compare these two terms? Is that what you say? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. However, what I do know is this. The method of dominant balance tells me that this, is, this guy is small compared with that term. That's all I know. Okay? And I know that this term, yeah, well, I was answering a different question. So, but we do know that this term is small compared with that term. But now the equation contains only two terms. So these are the two biggest terms. So this must be the same size as that term, because there are only two terms in the equation. So we could never get 0 here. We could never get a cancellation. It's not really 0. But we could never get something small over here unless this term and this term were roughly the same size. I don't know how big this term is compared with that term. The two terms that are neglected are not necessarily the same size. But they're both negligible compared with the terms in the equation we're keeping. And we know that this and this have to be the same size asymptotically, okay? because there's only two terms. So one must balance the other. That's what this equation says. So we get this result. Aha. Now, I claim without proof, so I emphasize without proof here, that we can now exponentiate the asymptotic approximation to s. Our asymptotic approximation to s is this. Plus or minus um, the integral of the square root of q minus 1 quarter log of q. So that's s. But y is equal to e to the s. So I claim that y is asymptotic to some constant with a plus or minus sign times e to the integral dt of the square root of q of t. And when you, when you exponentiate that, you get divided by q to the 1 quarter as x goes to 0. We have just derived something spectacular. How many of you know what we just derived? What is this? Say, say it again. Yes. Boom. We just derived the WKB approximation. This is a fantastic result. This is WKB. OK? If you look in a book, you'll see that this is the WKB approximation to the uh, eigenfunctions of a Schrodinger equation. This is the standard WKB formula. Except we do much better than WKB because we've got all the higher order terms, which we're going to talk about shortly. OK, yep. Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry. Plus or minus. Yeah. OK, yeah. Yes. So I claim, OK, without proof, as I said, that the next term in the series will be um, you know, there's, there's a next term here which is going to be some constant, which doesn't matter. Okay, it doesn't matter because this is a linear equation. So when I make an, when I have an exponential, when I exponentiate a constant, I, that's the same as multiplying by a constant. So I don't ever need to include a constant. Okay, I don't need to include a constant. It's just the exponential of that constant gives this. But I claim that the next term in the series is something or other which is going to 0 as x approaches a. And since it's going to 0, that justifies exponentiating this uh, result here. OK. And it gives me this. And oh, I'm sorry. x goes, this goes to 0. Uh, this is an a here. In, ah, thank you, as x goes to a. Yeah. A, typically, a is infinity, but it doesn't have to be infinity. OK? So we have derived. This is a fantastic result. Look at that. Out pops WKB. Uh, WKB is just a special case, a special simple case of asymptotics. So we have something far, far more general. Yeah.
Yes, why can we differentiate? You're asking me, why can we differentiate an asymptotic relation? OK, and in general, um, in general, so I'm going to give you a more detailed answer than you might want, OK? But in general, it is almost always valid to integrate an asymptotic relation, OK? And the proof that you can integrate both sides of an asymptotic relation and it will remain asymptotic, that's called, um, and that you prove that because there are a series of theorems called abelian theorems, which justify integration. Okay. However, differentiating an asymptotic relation is not always valid, in general. So, okay. So it's sometimes valid. But it may not be valid. It may be that if you differentiate both sides of an asymptotic relation, it ceases to be an asymptotic relation. It ceases to be. So an example, if you'd like an example of such a relationship, consider this. Um, x squared, you would agree that x squared plus x uh, is asymptotic to x squared uh, as x goes to 0. You would agree with that, right? I'm sorry, as x goes, let's make it as x goes to infinity, right? That's, an asymptot that's a valid asymptotic relation, OK? Now, let me add something insignificant. Just the way x was insignificant compared with x squared as x goes to infinity, let me add, say, sine of x to the 25th power. It's still a valid asymptotic relation, right? Because this is no bigger than 1. But if I differentiate it, I get the equation, I get the relation x or 2x plus 1 would be asymptotic to 2x plus, now the derivative of this is 25x to the 24 times cosine of x to the 25. Now this is very big, and this is no longer a valid asymptotic. So the danger with differentiating an asymptotic relation is that you might have a situation like this. But fortunately, we are solving differential equations. Okay? And this differential equation, a differential equation says that derivatives are controlled. Okay? So why are they controlled? This differential equation says that the second derivative of y is proportional to y. Okay, And if we're a more general equation, it might be proportional to y plus y prime. Therefore, if you want to know y prime, you, all you need to do is to integrate this. So y prime is really the integral of something involving y. Therefore, we don't need a Tauberian theorem. An abelian theorem is sufficient. So, to justify differentiation of an asymptotic relation, you need to prove what is called a Tauberian theorem. But in this case, we don't need a Tauberian theorem, which, is, which such theorems are very subtle to justify differentiation of an asymptotic relation. But rather, because we have a differential equation, we know that we can calculate a second derivative by using the equation itself and a first derivative by integration. Okay, so we don't have to worry. So if we're using asymptotics to solve differential equations, we never have to worry about differentiating both sides when, when we do our calculations, differentiating both sides of an asymptotic relation. Fortunately, very fortunate. Okay, so we're not talking in general about asymptotic relations. We're only talking about asymptotic relations for finding solutions to differential equations. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. It blows up. That doesn't mean that it's not asymptotic. It just blows up. That's because the derivative of the square root of x. You see, what I was calculating was the ratio. So I was calculating over there y exact divided by this, and y exact, y exact 
divided by y to the 2 over the uh, e to the 2 over the square root of x times x to the 3 quarters. This thing is some constant, or what did I call the constant? d, or something like this. So, 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 so some constant, let's call it a0, a0 plus a1 times the square root of x plus a2 times x plus. And if I take the derivative of this, if I look at the slope of this, this is the curve that I'm plotting. If I look at the derivative, the slope of this, this goes like 1 over the square root of x, which is blowing up at 0. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly OK. Yeah, it's perfectly OK. Mm -hmm. It is blowing up, but we don't care. That's, that's fine. still as entire. It says that if we take the derivative of this, what it says is that, indeed, the derivative of that does, is asymptotic to 1 over the square root of x. And you can see that it is. Well, you can't see that it is, but this curve suggests that it is. Okay. OK, so now, um, well, OK. Oh, good. Now I have a problem for, oh, this is good. We'll save some time in the course. <laughs> OK, I, I'm not going to do the whole calculation, but because in fact, I think that's kind of boring. But let me outline a pro You're going to have a practice today, right? Or, or you don't have, ah, that's right. This is the colloquium day. OK, but let's, let me do it anyway. Let me just outline what we, what we need to do next. Let's see, where will we do that? How about, oh no, we can make this go up. Um, OK. So the question is, we're not done. You understand that what we have done is reduced the problem of solving a very hard differential equation to an infinite sequence of steps. And this could take a very long time. So I'm going to do all the rest of the steps in one shot, okay? because this is a simple enough equation that we can do that. So this is what um, I suggest that you do before next time, because that will save me the time of the trouble of boring you to tears in class. Okay, I don't want to bore you. So here we go. We are claiming that y is not equal to, but is asymptotic to, um, e to the uh, 2 over the square root of x um, times x, uh, what is it, minus 3 quarters, right? Is it plus 3 quarters or minus 3 quarters? It's plus 3 quarters. 3 quarters, OK, uh, times a series, if we continue this process, OK, times a series of the form a sub n, and I claim it has the form uh, x to the n over 2. And it's a sum from 0 to infinity. And this is valid as x goes to 0. And I claim that. Number one, asymptotic series are unique by our definition of asymptotic series. Therefore, we, if we have two asymptotic series, we can compare them term by term, just as we do with the Taylor series. So here's um, a 10-minute project for you. Do the following. We are solving this differential equation. Uh, y double prime times x cubed is equal to y. Take this series representation, OK? Call this for the moment, let's call this w. OK, this is some function of x. And plug this into this differential equation. OK, this is not hard for you to do. So for example, in order to do that, we first have to calculate y prime. And y prime, the derivative of this, we're differentiating three terms, that guy, that guy, and that guy. OK? So when you take the derivative of this, you will have an overall factor of e to the 2 over the square root of x. And 
when you differentiate um, w, you'll have w prime x to the 3 quarters, um, right? And when you differentiate the x to the 3 quarters, you'll have 3 quarters x to the minus 1 quarter times w. And when you differentiate the exponential, the derivative of the exponential will give you uh, 1 will give you minus 1 over x to the 3 halves, minus 1 over x to the 3 halves. So that'll give you minus x to the minus 3 quarters, not plus 3 quarters, minus times w. OK? That's the first step. OK? But that's not, we're not done yet. So here's the boring part. The next part is y double prime is e to the 2 over the square root of x times yuck. OK? Now you plug this into the equation, and you will get a four-term equation for w. So this will give you an equation for w of the form w prime prime plus yuck times w prime plus yuck is equal to 0. OK? Now, w is this series. So let w be the series from 0 to infinity, a sub n, x to the n over, uh, x to the, to the n over 2. Plug that in. Compare, compare the terms in, the, in this series, the resulting series, term by term. And obtain an equation for a sub n. OK? And what you will get is a recursion relation. And this, is, this is like a homework problem, because I promise you, if you've done it right, it will simplify at the end. That's why I chose this equation. In general, this could be a three-term recursion relation. But it isn't. It's a two-term recursion relation. And you get a rec recursion relation of the form a sub n plus 1 is a plus n times b plus n over c plus n times a n, OK, times some constant d. That's the form of the recursion relation. So this is solvable. Okay, so to find the next a, all you need to do is to just do this to this to this to the previous a. That's it. Okay, and you should go home and do that. Okay, and this is just arithmetic. Okay, and actually, it's a very good exercise. I think this is this is good to do. What are you going to find? Well. This says that a sub n, if you solve this recursion relation, a sub n is some sort of factorial. You know, this is something like n plus a factorial, and um, this is n. n plus b factorial over n plus c factorial times some constant to the n, something like this. OK. Oops, you say. For large n, you have a factorial times a factorial over a factorial. This roughly cancels. But roughly speaking, the nth term in the series is growing like n factorial. And that is the answer to your question that you asked me about a half an hour ago. Okay? So you notice that this series is not a convergent series. That's always, essentially always this always happens. In fact, if we do this in quantum mechanics with WKB, the corrections to this WKB approximation are, in general, a divergent series. And here we have a divergent series. Divergent series are inevitable. They come up when you solve differential equations. You may not like series to diverge. Maybe in your gut, you're still back in college and you're saying, no, 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 all series have to converge. I hate series that diverge. Nope. You have to face up to it. 
because this series naturally comes our, out of our analysis, and we have to do something with the series. When we solve this differential equation, the answer comes out in this form, and this is a divergent series, and we have to do something about that. Yeah. Oh, wait, just before I answer, just one last remark. Um, the first term here, because we can pull out a constant, we can pull out some constant here, we can assume, we can assume that the first term in this series, a0, is 1. The next term, a1, will turn out to be something like 3, um, uh, will be something like 3 sixteenths times the square root of x. Oh, there's no boundary condition. We're, there's no boundary condition here. We're, we're saying, let's just look at the growing series, for example. Oh, we haven't, we haven't said what these constants are. We're not yet talking about determining. And we're going to do that when we discuss WKB in the class. Yeah, there may be an initial value or a boundary value, which we're not talking about yet. Okay, But over here, there's a 3 16 square root of x. And I just want to show you one last picture quickly. Yeah, we'll just take a second. OK. If we now include, so I'm now taking the, it's actually minus 3 16 So this is minus 3 16 square root of x. If you now say, let's look at the ratio between the exact solution y of x and this, um, you know, this exponential times x to the 3 quarters, but also the first two terms in that series, now look at the way it approaches this constant. It's the same constant, 0 0.1432, but now look at the way our improved asymptotic approximation, that is, the effect of including one term, or rather two terms in this series, not just one term, but two terms in the series, Look now at, the, at how wonderful the approximation is. You understand, this is, this is 0.12 here. This is 0 0.13, 0 0.14, 0 0.15. The error, I mean, this is, this is just a, a tiny sliver out of the whole y-axis, OK? Look at how accurate this asymptotic approximation is. So all the way from about you know, from about 0.6 or 0.7, something like that here, all the way down to, zero, to x equals 0, the relative error between the exact solution and the first two terms in the asymptotic series is just a few percent. You see that? It's just a few percent. In fact, this calculation was done in the limit as x goes to 0, right? But Apparently, 0.7 is close enough to 0 to have a really accurate approximation. How close do you have to be to 0 to say that you're near 0? We don't know. But if you look at this answer, you notice that from here on down, this is a fabulously good approximation. And we've only taken two terms in that asymptotic series. If we take three terms, it gets even better. OK, now, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted somebody's question, or I think I did. Did I interrupt? No, I didn't. OK. Um, yes, question, good. Um, <coughs> nope. <coughs> you remember, we introduced a C of x. And that gave us this logarithm. I didn't do the calculation, because I didn't want to bore everybody to tears. But the next step in the process would be to say, OK, we found the c. So we said, you know, we, we said s is equal to plus or minus 2 over the square root of x. right? And then we got this 3 quarters uh, log of x. And then we now could have put in a new function, plus d where d is negligible compared with log of x as x goes to 0. And now you find that d 
when you solve the equation that d is asymptotic to a constant which you can always ignore because this is a linear equation and an additive constant in the exponential is just a multiplicative constant of, over the solution. So who cares about a constant? And the next term is the square root of x. But we're looking at the limit <coughs> as x goes to 0. So when we exponentiate the square root of x, it's actually minus 3 sixteenths square root of x. When you exponentiate that, minus 3 sixteenths square root of x, that is approximately 1 minus 3 sixteenths square root of x. That's where it comes from. And if I said, all right, set this equal to minus 3 sixteenths uh, square root of x and put in e. OK, now you would find that e is approximately x plus f. OK, <clears throat> so that's how you find it out. And then do you notice the next term will be x to the 3 halves and then x squared and then x to the 5 halves and x cubed and so on. And all of a sudden it occurs to you, ooh, there's some regularity that has appeared here. <laughs> and so <clears throat> that is OK. So what I'm proposing is that you go home and verify that this is the complete asymptotic approximation to the function. That's it. That's the whole, that's the whole circus all together. Everything fits together. We have this piece, the most rapidly varying component, this, the Frobenius-like component, this, the Taylor, sort of Taylor-like component. So regular singular, regular point, regular singular point, irregular singular point. You notice that nested structure? It's really beautiful. But this isn't a Taylor series because typically this is a divergent series. Okay? And that's the whole package from beginning to end. So we have analyzed this differential equation in the limit as x goes to 0. <clears throat> it's a little bit more elaborate than what you taught in class when you showed them how to find a Taylor series solution, which is a convergent series solution. But next time, I'm going to show you that this is orders of magnitude better than any Taylor series solution that you get. And you're going to see, that, you're going to see why that's true, which is really wonderful. Okay? But I guess one last comment. Last comments keep appearing. OK, one last comment. Suppose you wanted to calculate y. What would you do? You would pade this series. Okay? And you could calculate y with arbitrary accuracy. Even though it's a divergent series, you pade it, and you can calculate y. You want 25,000 decimal places? No problem. You pade it, you'll get as many decimal places as you like. Even though we can never, ever write an equal sign here. So this is not equal to the function y. But when you pade it, it comes as close as you like. Isn't that wonderful? It's a fantastic new way of thinking about mathematics. <clears throat> OK, any other, any further questions? OK, so next time we have to talk about this monster that we have given birth to. OK, We've, we were inevitably led to this conclusion, and it's all due to Mr. Green. OK, 200 years ago.